morning. Write your Bibles, please open them to Numbers chapter 11. <coughs> Numbers 11, we're going to read some selected verses. Um, they come out into the wilderness in Moses' leading them and God, but faithfully giving them the manna, but some people decided they were very tired of manna. That's why we pick up the story here in verse 4, Numbers 11, 4. The rabble who were among them had greedy desires, and also, I don't want to say, also the sons of Israel wept again and said, who will give us meat to eat? Go to verse 10. Now Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, each man at the doorway of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly, and Moses was displeased. Skip to verse 18. The Lord is saying, speaking here, and he says, Say to the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Oh, that someone would give us meat to eat. For we will, were well off in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. You shall eat, not one day, nor two days nor five days, nor ten days, nor twenty days, but a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you. Because you've rejected the Lord who is among you and you went before him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? But Moses said, uh, the people among who I am are 600,000 on foot. Now those 600,000, when they did the census, they didn't count anybody but the men of fighting age. So those are between 10 and 60. There's 600,000 men between 10 and 60, plus all the women, plus all the older and younger men, plus the children, right? Two to three million people is what scholars have estimated. Moses said, the people know who I am are 600,000 on foot, and yet you have said, I will give them meat, so that they may eat for a whole month. Should flocks and herds be slaughtered for them to be sufficient for them? Or should all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to be sufficient for them? And the Lord said to Moses, is the Lord's power limited? Now you shall see whether my word will come true or not. The Lord asked Moses an important question, verse 23. Is the Lord's power limited? In the New King James, that verse says, has the Lord's hand been arm been shortened? And the Amplified says it this way, it says, the Lord said to Moses, has the Lord's hand, his ability and power become short, thwarted, and inadequate? You shall see now whether my word shall come to pass for you. Now the Lord has told them that he will do the impossible. I mean, what if you're sitting in the middle of the desert and people are tired of man? I mean, it's one thing for man to come down like dew and dry, but it's another thing completely for there to be meat. And, and Moses is saying, how in the world are you going to get herds through the desert to us? Now, the Lord asked him in, in exchange, is my hand weak? Now, we must recognize, but let's skip down before we do that. Let's look at verse 31 to 32. Now, there went forth a wind from the Lord, and it brought quail to the sea and let them fall beside the camp. About a day's journey on this side and a day's journey on the other side, and all around the camp were about, were about two cubits deep on the surface of the ground. And the people spent all day and all night and all the next day gathering the quail. He who gathered least gathered ten homers, and they spread them out for themselves around the camp. You know what a homer is? The margin of my Bible says that one homer equals eleven bushel. Eleven bushel. So the guy that got the least got ten, uh, uh, ten homers, and that's 110 bushels. When God brought the meat, he brought them meat. Amen. Now, we must first of all recognize that the people who followed Moses had no respect for the Lord or his power. That's pretty obvious, right? Oh, we wish you were back in Egypt. What is that God of yours? We're tired of you. They didn't respect God or his power, but listen, that didn't affect his ability to do over and above all they could have asked or thought. Amen. Now, when I, I want to ask you today, when you look ahead to 2013, is the Lord's power limited? Is his hand too inadequate? Moses could not even imagine. This is the believer in the midst of them. You got all these unbelievers treating God terribly. The one believer could not imagine. 
how God himself could feed millions of people meat for a month. How do you get that many flocks and herds into the desert? And the Lord said, don't sweat it, Mom. Don't lie in under their own skin. Isn't that amazing? We somehow unconsciously put limits on our expectations of Almighty God. Because we assume that if we can't figure it out, he certainly couldn't. Wow. <laughs> we could just stop right there and hold the for a while. <laughs> if it's too big for us to ask the thing, he couldn't imagine it either or come up with a plan on his own. And yet what was over and above, all that Moses could even imagine, was a piece of cake in the sight of God. Yeah, it wasn't even a good afternoon's work for God. Oh, in 110 bushels each, and well, wow. not any sweat on God. No. Ephesians 3.20 in the Holman Christian Standard Bible <coughs> says this, that him who's able to do above and beyond all that we ask and think. Say above and beyond. Yeah. He's able to do above and beyond all that we ask and think according to the power that works in you. Yeah. God wants you to use you this year above and beyond yeah, yeah, what you yeah. think your life could be used. Yeah, and you say, oh, well, if I'm used, I'll just feel like a wet dish rag. If you, no, no. <laughs> when God uses somebody, he blesses you. When yeah. you become a channel for the Holy Spirit of God, he blesses you on the way through because he's a blessing going somewhere to happen. Yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of you would dare say that he's already done above and beyond in your life what you would have dared ask the day you got saved? Yeah. You couldn't even have thought of your life being this good. Yeah. He's not done. No. He's not out of ideas. He's not out of power. Amen. Your life already reflects God's unlimited nature, thinking, imagination, love, and ability. So what are your expectations for the coming year? The name of today's message is Limitless. Everybody say limitless. limitless. What are some of the limiting factors that you may need to take off of your thinking? Number one, your age. Now, that isn't true for you 20-year-olds. <laughs> or for some people who, when the, and here's what the devil does, if you're over 40 in this society, you say, you know, 20-year-olds have got it made. They got the world by the throat. But what about you? I, you know, we can all grow quietly and silently, but that's the mentality of our society, right? Yeah. I'm going to tell you that God is not impressed by your birth certificate. God is only impressed by what he still has on the agenda left for you to do. Amen. Right. Amen. I mean, this is terribly important. If you're over 40, especially, you need to hear this. God could care less what year you were born or what it says on your birth certificate. He cares about what you were created to do. And if you've got stuff to do, then you better start thinking 30, whether you feel it or not. He said, well, this is all a big joke. Hey, Moses started this ministry at 80. You know how old Moses was when he talked to the God of the universe in the burning bush? 80. He was 40 when he left Egypt. He was 40 years serving as a shepherd. And at the age of 80, God appeared to him. Yeah. So you see, if you write yourself off because of your age, that would be a tragic mistake because there's people that need to hear the gospel. Amen. 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 So the first limiting factor might be your age. The second might be regrets. Are your life, is your life full of if onlys? And are your own only putting a lid on your expectation? Now the truth is that no one can change the past, but God can make it like it never was because he's a God that gives second chances and new opportunities. How many of you can say, I got a lease on life that I never thought there would ever be a lease on life? Amen. Hallelujah. What else could you put on a limit on your life? A perceived lack of qualifications. A lot of Christians don't really expect to be used by God because they open their ears to the enemy who says, well, you know, like, what have you got going for you? Oh, my spite in here. Yeah. Let me ask you, what would you do for God if you knew you could? Uh -huh. And you say, is this about doing something for God? Well, you know, I'll be honest with you. We are a prosperity church, a healing church. We believe in the full gospel that God, God's covenant covers every single area of your life. But that is not, you are not about you. Amen. Amen. Go quiet right there. Amen. You're not about you. The gospel's not about you. The gospel is about God using you to get somebody else saved and on his yes. way through you. will bless you. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. We're going to look and every one of us is getting ready for exams. Amen. Exams are about 20 minutes away in, in the scope of eternity. About 20 minutes we're up for finals. Wow. Yep. And we'll give an account for what we've done with our lives. Right. 
And the important thing about the beginning of a new year is it's almost inevitable that we at least pause long enough to take one deep breath and think, wow, where have I been and where am I going and are we making any progress? Right. Right, yeah. It may be your self-image that limits your expectations. Mm -hmm. That's right. Think about this. Do you think your personality excludes you from being used by God? Well, well, I mean, if you look at who's used by God in the scriptures, it is a motley bunch. Yes. I mean, it really is. Elijah was a character. I don't care how much you like Elijah and like the results of his life, he was a character. Jonah was a mess. You say, should you talk like this about the prophets? Oh, God adores them, and in heaven you'll adore them. But Jonah got himself in the belly of that fish of his own doing. I mean, he worked hard to get in the belly of that fish. God said specifically, I want to say Nineveh, go preach. And he said, I don't like Nineveh. And he ran the other way. And then he gets in the belly of the fish, right? I didn't have any of this in my notes. But you see, there's hope for us. Even with all our little idiosyncrasies and, you know, maladjustments in time. So he gets in the belly of the fish and he wakes up. Now you think he'd be waking up for a very, very long time. He's been waking up for a couple of days. Yeah. He got thrown up, whale vomit and all, cleaned himself off, went and preached in the, in the whole place pretended. Yeah. Now this is an awesome thing. This is what every evangelist lives for. So you see 120,000 people repent, right? Amen. So he goes up and waits for God to kill him. When God doesn't kill him, he gets real mad at God. Wow. And God says, are you mad? Are you right to get mad? You know, the plant died and everything? And God says, look, how much do I care about this town? I mean, this guy is... <coughs> He's not perfect. No. And he got right with God again. And aren't you glad God was second, yes, third, yes, fourth, yes, fifth yes, chances, yes, 737 yes. chances, right? And he said, what are you talking about? Don't let your personality count you out for being used by God. He said, well, I'm shy. There's anybody in this place shyer than I was. And you say, oh, you're making it up. No, I'm not. I just got but cards from all my family in Ohio where I grew up. I promise you there is not anybody in this whole place, 12 of you put together, were to shy as I was. And say, what happened to you? I'm the living God. Right. And then there is no fear. Yeah. If you, I mean, when you know the living God, I mean, it doesn't matter what everybody else thinks. Love you all, but I'll tell you something. If I'm good with him, I'm good. This is a cool way to live, fearless. So don't think that your personality keeps you from being used by God. The truth is you can be certified, accredited, endorsed, and authenticated by the Holy Spirit bearing witness to hearts as you speak. Amen. And you say, well, how would that happen? By spending time with the King of Kings. You spend time with the yeah. King of Kings, he rubs off. Amen. When he rubs off, that's called the anointing, and he bears witness. He qualifies you to do whatever you're called to do, despite any apparent lack of credentials. I'm in favor of Bible college. I'm in favor of education. But it won't really be a Bible college exam the wrong that will get people healed. Amen. That's right, sure. And if you don't, I mean, this is the truth. You know what will come? What happened to the disciples? They rubbed your up. He, Jesus rubbed off on them walking right. together with them for three and a half years. Mm. You walk with God and you serve God and you're obedient to God. God will work miracles through you because it's a part of who you are. Yeah. And that got real quiet. <clears throat> How many of you would be okay with letting God into your presence? You see, he's already let you into his. He said, come boldly to the throne of grace. Now, what kind of invitation do you want? You want an engraved invitation from the sky every morning? That's your invitation. God Almighty looked at you and said, through the blood of Jesus, come boldly into my presence. He's, you're in. You say Jesus and you're in. The question is, will you let him into your presence? He's already let you into his. He said, well, how do I... Just like we talked last week, you open your thoughts to him. Amen. To where you don't think, think, think about God, you hold him out there, you say, Lord. And you let him into every conversation you have with yourself. Right. And you say, yeah, but he's got to talk to me, your, my thoughts out. Yeah, he will. Yep. Yeah, he will. Every thought you think that nasty and negative about yourself, is, the Holy Spirit will just be your bouncer. That won't. Amen. He said, where would I possibly end up? It says taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. When you take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, you know where you end up in the presence of God. When you end up in the presence of God, he's going to use you. You say, why? Because he needs you to touch the lost. All right, let's look at Numbers 11.4. We read it in the New American Standard. The Lord said, it said, contentable people among them had a strong craving for other food. 
The Israelites cried again and said, could we have meat? Now, if we could go to read the same verse, Numbers 11, 4 in the Holman Christian Bible. It says, contemptible people among them had a strong craving for their food, and the Israelites cried out again and said, who will feed us meat? Next verse. We remember the free fish we ate, along with the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. Now our appetite is gone, and there's nothing to look at but this manna. Next verse. Well, we can stop there. You're right. Listen, if I have read this again, as a question. Did any of these people have a real respect for God? No. You know what they had a respect for? They had a respect for their carnal appetites. Now stop and think. Did their complete lack of respect for God cause God to change his power? No. You see, we would, here's what we're thinking right now. We're thinking, we're in a post-Christian America. You know what? Every true revival has happened in a post-Christian society. A Christian <coughs> society doesn't need mighty earth-shaking revival. Come on. That's true. Yeah. Part of the reason that we have a hard time, do you realize what like, this nation needs? Man, we need something to happen with this fiscal cliff. But that's only going to be a temporary reprieve if they get a deal. Because what we really need is respect for Almighty God and His principles that you don't go into debt and you don't kill babies. We need to be standing with the Green family, this, with Hobby Lobby, saying we will not put our money into abortion because the life of one unborn child is worth $1.3 million a day. Come on. And you say, well, it's just hopeless in this society. That's exactly what the devil wants you to believe. But in every society that has ever seen a mighty move of God, it's because they desperately need it. Because the Lord did not say, I will pour water on the well-watered land. He said, I will pour water on the one that's thirsty. Amen. And I'll show you, the United States of America qualifies. What I wanted you to see in this scripture is that their complete lack of respect had not one iota of effect on God's power. He fed them anyway. Will Hollywood ever limit the power of the Almighty? They say you didn't know about that one. When 600,000 people were saying, look, go back to verse 4. We're just straight back in the same place. These people were a mess. Contemptible people. They had a strong craving. They had strong carnal cravings. And we want me. We don't care about God. Zero spiritual aptitude, okay? Zero point zero. There's 600,000 of them railing against Moses. And poor Moses is saying, where are you going to get him? And it didn't affect the power of God one bit. The reason we have trouble believing for a move of God is we don't know history. And I'm not sure this is not in any way a condemnation. I grew up a preacher's kid. Love God. I didn't know any church history. I went through all of school. I went through a four-year Christian university. And I never had a class in church history. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm not sure where we're supposed to pick up church history. But because of our woeful ignorance of church history, we don't realize the move of God this nation has seen and other nations have seen. George Whitfield was a flaming revivalist in the early 1700s. He got kicked out of the churches. He stood up on the fence and began to preach. And it started out with a thousand, and then it grew to upwards of 30,000 people in England. He, he came over here. I've got passages marked in a book. I've time to read them for you. He came over here. Now listen to this. Before the revolution, at least four out of five colonists had heard him preach. He was the most recognizable person to all the colonists except the king and queen of England. If you show them a photo of someone, they could recognize him, number three in the whole world, because they loved him. One man, I have a personal account in this book, he went to his meeting and he'd come a long ways and he thought, oh no, there's a dust storm, they'll have to cancel the meeting. It wasn't a dust storm. The dust was being churned up by all the covered wagons and the horses and there were people coming by boat to hear the preacher. They, up to 20,000, Benjamin Franklin figured that 30,000 people could hear him preach. And you say, who are you glorifying a man? I'm glorifying the power of the gospel yeah. to change the society. And yet here we are, and I say, could God impact Hollywood? Oh, who's what Hollywood? Who's Hollywood? Who is the power behind Hollywood? The devil. The devil is a liar. And until somebody stands up and says, God Almighty is God Almighty, and you will never change his power. Will Hollywood ever limit the power of the Almighty? Absolutely not. We're not seeing a move of God because somebody, nobody, not enough people are preaching the gospel. The gospel is more powerful than that. 
Will our culture's brazen acceptance of gay marriage and abortion cause his arm to be shortened or his whole holiness compromised? No. Never. No. Never. Anyone, anywhere who knows the righteousness and holiness of God and has an intact personal covenant with God can see miracles Amen. upon which the world can put no limit. Yes. Now let's look at Numbers 11, 21 to 23 again. It says, but Moses, the people, the people, among whom I am are 600,000 on foot, and yet you have said, I will give them meat so that they may eat for a whole Should flocks and herds be slaughtered for them to be sufficient for them? Or should all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to be sufficient for them? And the Lord said to Moses, is the Lord's power limited? Is my hand short? Is who I am compromised? And you say, oh no, not in that case. We all believe that 1,500 years or so before Christ, he could bring quail. But you know, the United States of America is a hard case. Yeah, he's God. Amen. All the unbelief of those 600,000 people plus had not the slightest effect on God's ability, ability. And all the unbelief of our ungodly culture, the demands that we compromise will not have the slightest effect on God. is still God. Amen. When Esther and Mordecai saved the Jewish race from destruction, they were surrounded by pagans. The Babylonian Hasperus and the Babylonian culture, they were pagans. Read the, cult, read the history. When a small band of 11 disciples and their, and their followers turned the world upside down, they did it in a real world full of idolatry. Right. You see, we think, well, if, if conditions were right, we could have a revival. We've never had a revival when conditions were right. Conditions don't stay right over a generation at a time. You get one generation saved, and the next generation comes along, and hey, guys, yeah. younger generation saved around here. I'm not putting you down, okay? But can I tell all the extremists, wave their hands, everybody who's between the age of 13, isn't this awesome? Okay, let me tell you something. When you get... To, in 20 years, you're going to have to have all your babies saved, because they don't get born saved. No, they don't. Revivals happen in ungodly cultures. Yeah, Joseph rose to be number two in the world when he did it in a pagan, pagan land called Egypt. Daniel, number two in the world, and he rose in, in a pagan land called Babylon. Yeah. There is no amount of ungodliness that will ever keep the Almighty from being who he is, the Amen. Almighty. Amen. Now listen to this statement. You don't write, put write anything else down. <clears throat> I knew I should not sing it today. No, I'm not, I'm not just, uh, I lose my voice. Uh, yeah. Listen. No amount of ungodliness, oops, that's the wrong statement. Here's this. God's ability to move is not based on the unbelief of the unbelievers. Amen. God's ability to move is based on the faith of believers. Yes. God can do anything, anywhere when he has a media people. Mm. His ability to move is not affected by unbelief. No. It's affected by our faith. Amen. Amen. The mightiest revivals have happened where they're needed the most, and we need His Spirit the most right now. We qualify. Yeah. If you say we're in a post-Christian environment, yeah, that's true, but that's what the environment that needs God to move. Amen. The Lord said, I'll pour water on the one that's thirsty. Yeah. Now listen, the devil has tried to get us so discouraged, and our expectations so dumbed down. I said dumbed down. Yeah. The bear, we don't we just keep the bills paid. Hold on to heaven. That's not what God wants you to expect from 2013. God expects you to be used, expect to be used wherever Amen. you are. Amen. Do you know what the Lord asked Abraham when Sarah left? Abraham, or the Lord showed up one day and said, a year from now I'm going to show up again and you're going to have a son. And Sarah left. Go to Genesis 18. I found out this is a question God asks a lot. He's asking you today. Genesis 18, verse 10. <clears throat> The Lord said, I will surely return to you at this time next year. And the old Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening. Now, if you know the story, but she's 89 and Abraham's 99. Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind him. And now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. And Sarah was past childbearing. <coughs> and Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being all old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, why does Sarah laugh, saying, shall I indeed bear a child when I'm so old? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? No. At this point in time, I will return to you. At this time next year, Sarah will have a son. Hallelujah. 
The alternate reading for that word difficult, the alternate translation is wonderful. Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? Did you know the Lord wants to use you in ways this year that you have never been used before? And before you quietly laugh like Sarah did, uh -huh. the Lord says to you, is it hard for me, too hard for me to heal the sick and cause them to cover when you pray? Is it, oh, now they just got real. Is it too hard for God to anoint your lips so that when you speak truth to those who need a Savior, they know it's the truth? Yeah. What are you expecting from God this year? Just what, another ordinary year of struggles? or an unforgettable, remarkable demonstration of the Lord's power. Amen. God wants us to be a force to be reckoned with. Amen. Now right now we're a force to be reckoned with economically in that nobody wants to be mad at them. The business people around you don't want to be mad at them because they don't want a bad name in this church because we're getting big enough. They don't want to <laughs> All right. Well, that's nice. More respect than we used to get. But there's another level. Where when God speaks through a body of believers and God speaks through us, they know that God has spoken and yes. that they have to listen. God wants the church in America to be a force that cannot be ignored. Yes. What if everybody could call themselves Christians, live like Christians, and voted like Christians, and stood up for the unborn? We would, you know, if ever. Yeah. What do you got to say? I'm telling you. I mean, I'm not just for Hobby Lobby, but I have respect for anybody that has the guts to say, I'm for babies, I'm priceless. Amen. And we need to be figuring out some way to stand with them. I don't know how, but if you can figure it out, tell me. The, every Christian in America should stand up and say, we're with them. They, because if you get loud enough, they don't be yeah. back down. Okay. Hallelujah. So, Numbers 11.23, the Lord asked Moses, is my hand short, is my power limited? And here, God asked Abraham, is anything too difficult for God? you know what the Lord asked Jeremiah in, in Jeremiah 32, 27? He said to Jeremiah, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? Now, don't get offended with me. But he said this to Moses. He said this to Abraham. He said this to Jeremiah. And he's saying this to you. Yeah. I am the Lord. Is revival in the northern neck too hard for me? Now, the funniest part about this is, he reminded me of something this morning. I was up early going over these notes, and I had completely forgotten this. this a true story. All of us in here have different categories of the part that's too hard for God. It's just that you're not going to admit to you. I'm not going to admit to you. Because if you ask me, is, can God do anything? I'm going to say, God can't do anything. Yeah. But I have my own little secret list where even God can do that. Come on. Wow. When we left CBN, we were, my husband was employed at CBN. We were living there, and Gordon sent us up one of the Pioneer Church many years ago, but this is a true story, and I remember, like, you know, when God speaks to you, the funny part is, it's like it happened two moments ago, because you can always take a person to where you were standing, it's unforgettable when God speaks. All right, so we had been up here, and Gordon had spoken once in the descending dove, and in my spirit, when I prayed, I was pretty sure this is where we're supposed to go. But you know, you can't tell your husband to do this. He's got to hear from God. Yeah. And I was really, really worried that he was. No, all you ladies look so many. <laughs> but I was really concerned that my husband was going to miss the big one. Okay. <laughs> now I didn't say that to one person. And you could have nailed me the wall, and I wouldn't admit it, but I was. Well, I had a darling little Pomeranian that never got me up at night. This darling Pomeranian got me up at 3 o'clock in the morning on a moonlit night. I took this dog out back to go. I looked up at the moon, and God spoke to me. And he said, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? I said, no. I said, no. Lord, if there's one thing that you've proven through the movement in my life, because I've been away from God, and I come back, and I've made it, and I'm never going away from God again. I knew he was God. I said, God, I know you are the God of all flesh, and I know nothing is too hard for me. Look at the dog almost went, and he spoke to me a second time. He said, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. He said, uh, Is too hard for me? I said, No, no, you can do anything. I get almost in the door and he said, For the third time, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? And, and I said, Lord, you know it's not. And I said, You know what? Now listen, I learned from Dad taking this. If you're not sure you're hearing from God, get the Bible book, okay? Because right. I thought, If this is the Lord, his record study. He said the exact same thing three times. I don't think it was probably God, because I know this. I opened my Bible, and my Bible fell open to Jeremiah, and it's 
just, you know how it is. And I said, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. And I said, I know that. And he said, Then why don't you think I can talk to your husband? Come on. And you say, That's not my problem. I'm glad you know you God can talk to your husband. Ladies, look at me. Uh -oh. A lot of you don't think God can talk to your husband. Ladies. Oh, they don't like it when I pick on them, so don't pick on them. Did you? Okay, look at it. How many of you know God can speak to your husband? How many? No, very many. Boy, this is sad. <laughs> I want to tell you something. That night, God wanted me to know that. Because I didn't make it up. God spoke to me. And then he confirmed it in his word. And then he said, okay, he said, what does this have to do? Because there's stuff you think God can't do. True. You have your own little personal... He said, why are you so hard on this? Because I want you to take the limits of what you're expecting God to do through you in 2013. God expects to use you to... How many of you believe that you can lead five people to the Lord in 2013? That's a stretch for us, but we need to believe that. We need to know that God... Now think about this. He asked Moses, is anything too hard for me? Is the Lord's hand short? He asked Abraham, is anything too difficult for me? You mean a, a man of 100 and a woman of 90 couldn't have a baby? And then he looked at Jeremiah and he said, Behold, I am the Lord of God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult to me? And then when he became God in the flesh, he asked the same question. He said, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Jesus came to say exactly what the Father said. I think this is two blind men came. Let's read the story and he said, This is too hard. Because he's asking you the same question today. He's saying to them, they said, we believe it, and they said, be it done to you according to your faith. Do you want to say it to you? Well, whatever you can believe, what are you going to have? Right. Let's read it. When he entered the house, is this God in the flesh? Same God of the Old Testament, right? Still saying the same thing. When he entered the house, the blind men came up to him. And Jesus said, do you believe that I am able to do this? In other words, is anything too hard for me? And if they said, no, this is a little bit too hard, they have got to be blind. Amen? Do you believe that I'm able to do this? And they said, yes, Lord. <laughs> Next verse. And then he touched their eyes, saying, it shall be done to you according to your faith. Now, if you want to tell me, Pastor, I don't have that anointing. I don't have that call in a bit evangelist. I'm not called to win the lost. Well, then the New Testament's a lie. Because we're all called to win the lost. Amen. Let's look at one verse, Ephesians 3.20, and then I'm going to show you the verses that say final exams are and coming up. Yep. Ephesians 3, verse 20. This is not a him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power of that works in us. There's really only one condition in that verse, and that's the power of God working in you. Wow. Now, the person next to you is not going to decide how much of the power of God works in you. And God is not going to decide. He's not going to come up to Patty and say, okay, I'm going to work in Patty's life this year, but I'm not going to work in Christianity. Do you know how much God's going to work in Christianity's life this year? She's going to love and she hates her do you know how much God's going to work in Christianity exactly as much as she can miss in church? That's right. And to the degree she misses in her student work, he will do exceeding abundantly. And he's going to work in you from exactly the degree that you allow him to work. So if you want him to do exceeding abundantly, you have to open up your heart and say, you can change me any way you want to change me. You can ask of me anything you want to ask. I am completely and totally available to you. Now you say, Pastor, I don't think I want to do that. Heard Keith Moore tell a funny story. Keith Moore is a great preacher, for instance. Missouri. He said he had somebody come into the church and a brand new convert and he says, Pastor, I just want to be used. And he said, well, we need help getting the light bulbs changed around here. Come on. So he started changing the light bulbs. And he says, well, we need people to go with the witnessing thing. So he started going. And he was busy for God. And one day he came to the pastor and he said, Pastor, I just feel so cute. <laughs> well, they want me to do this. They want me to help with baby. I'm so used. And Brother Moore said, well, you know, I think that's what you prayed for. <laughs> Can I tell you a secret? The boat that Jesus prayed or preached out of that they felt used. Jesus asked for permission to preach from Peter's boat, right? And he used it. But then what did he do? He blessed it with so many fish. 
than the next tour. When you get used of God, you are going to be used. Yeah. But then you're also going to be blessed because as he flows through you, he blesses. I want you to look. Okay. This was supposed to be a happy story. Now you see it starts out happy because honestly, for some of you, just to be completely free from 100% of all addiction would be exceeding abundant all, beyond all you can ask to think. But I'm here to tell you that it's not bigger than God. No, it's not. Moses said, no way. There is no way to get flocks and herds in the middle of the desert. And God said, no way. Yeah. God is able to do over and above what you can even comprehend according to the power that works in you. If, if, if you don't, we say, well, I don't want too much of that power, then he can only do so much. But if you say, look, whatever you want to do, you know, here I am, he can, okay? I want you to look at a couple of scriptures because 2 Corinthians 5, we'll be done in 10 minutes here. 2 Corinthians 5, if you ask me, do you believe more to fake churches? Well, number one, I guess I have to because we are one. Okay, we are a word of faith church. Yeah. <laughs> but if you ask me, do you have any reservations about word of faith churches? Yes. You say, oh, you're dreadfully frank. I'm just, I'm just telling you. I have reservations about word of faith churches because they've attracted sometimes a certain kind of Christian. Yeah. We drive them off around here. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, listen carefully, though. When God says, God wants to make you rich, he wants to bless you, he wants you to have plenty. That's good. <laughs> we all work out. He wants you to eat. That's good. Yeah. But we haven't always preached the balance. Because Jesus said, unless somebody takes up their cross and follows you. Yeah. Amen. 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 All right? Amen. So God, I, I'm probably convinced that every single person here, God wants you totally free from all bondage, all addiction, Amen. whether it's psychological, whatever. He wants you totally, completely free, healed, completely free of pain, positive of that. He wants your village paid to where you can have more than enough to be a blessing. That's God's very best. But to live in that place of glorious blessing, it will cost you something because there are souls on the line. And God loves souls too much to let you live selfishly. Amen. Look at Luke 2 Corinthians 5, 6. Paul says, therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and we are rather to be absent from the body than to be at home with the Lord. Mm. And what did he just say? Anybody in the right mind would prefer to be in heaven. Mm. Yeah. That's what he just said, okay? But since we can't be in heaven, verse 9 says, therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home, in heaven, or absent here, to be pleasing to him. Why? Why is there this consuming, if you don't think there was a consuming desire in the Apostle Paul's life, read the book of Acts. He went through shipwrecks. He went through floggings. He went through more than you and I can even get our mind around. I mean, if, if one co-worker looks at this funny because we wear a cross or something, it's just about that's persecution. No, it's not persecution. It's persecution. It's having your back laid open. All right? And yet he, he couldn't quit. Why? Verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Okay. And what does that mean? It means that we are going to be recompensed good or bad. Now, if, you, if your sins are washed by the blood of Jesus, you make heaven. But there is an eternity to follow. It isn't just like make it or break it. There is an eternity to follow in your status, your reward, and the eternity to follow will be according to this life. You see, is that your whole motivation? Like the real motivation that keeps you going here in the ministry is that you love God so much that even on the days when you don't feel the love for the lost, you love them passionately because it's his heart throb. Wow. All God cares about is people. Yeah. How can we be so selfish? is to let somebody pour good love and tithes and everything into getting us saved and say, okay, I'm saved. Who do I care about anybody else? And I know a bunch of Christians. If you're going to go by their lives, that's exactly the road they're on. That's not what Paul says. Look here. We must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Therefore, in verse 11, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men that we are made manifest to God. If we know the fear of the Lord, what do we do? Our whole life is about how to get somebody saved. Yeah. Look at me. Everybody
everybody this year ought to have a vision of getting some people saved. Hallelujah. Go to 1 Corinthians 3. This is in just one place in the Bible. We may not preach very often, but... <coughs> First Corinthians 3.10 According to the grace of God which was given to me like a wise master builder I laid a foundation and another is building on it but each man must be careful how he builds upon it. And he's talking about the churches he founded. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work remains which he is built upon it, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yes, so as but through fire. And what does that mean? It means that every you could conceivably do many, many, many good things for a church but do them so that, you know, we used to have Sunday school pins. We may go back far enough to when you got a Sunday school pin for perfect attendance, and some people, they would, like, drag off their suit coats onto the floor and whatever. You can do things to impress people, and that's like when your straw is going to burn up. But when you pray in secret for the salvation of someone, or you minister kindness to somebody that you know can't repay you, when you build with the love of God, that is, what does it call it? Gold and silver. Verse 12. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, what does that mean? That means that you're pouring the best part of your day into somebody else being helped and saved. Well, I'm not getting any amens. And you say, why would I want to do that? Okay, let's think. Why would you want to do that? Number one, because you appreciate the Savior who gave everything. I mean, isn't that enough? Yeah. Number two, because you will stand before him and your life will be there and a consuming fire will come down and everything done out of selfishness and pride and to be seen will be consumed but what was done out of a genuine love for God and people will abide and that will be your reward. That's number two. And the third thing is just simply because decency. Common decency demands that the American church support missions. Yeah. And if you don't understand that, I doubt that you've been abroad. Come on. Come on. If you don't understand, why do you say common decency? Uh -huh. Because if you go to a third world country and they literally can't feed their babies, uh -huh. the very least we can do is give them some food and the gospel, because if you give them the gospel, God will help them feed their babies. Yeah. It's our responsibility to see. Now, I want to take that part. You understand that we are going to stand before God. Amen. And the worst part is, if he had enough, it was just you and him. Now it's going to be you and him and all the angels and every human being that's ever lived. And on that day, if I did all this out of selfish motives, you'd go to find out the whole thing was self. And you know, I'm, we've all done some things out of selfish motives. We kid ourselves if we have not. But what we want to do at the beginning of the year, they say, number one, I had to stand before God, but what I had to give that was given out of a heart of love. And I've done Two, if I'm looking forward to the year, am I just sort of, and he says, do you believe I'm able to do great things for you? And say, uh, if the devil's told you you're too old, stand up and say, that's a damnable lie. Yeah. If the, devil, if the devil's told you you're not bright enough, stand up and say, that's just stupid. If you say you didn't have enough schooling, say neither did the disciples. Okay, you've got to put to, lie, to rest the lies. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to, to share with you, the enemy has so tried to limit our expectations on the move of God. And I want to tell you something, God can move anywhere, anytime, any place he has an obedient people. Amen. And I won't, I'm not going to read you the part about Whitfield. He just he saw the most amazing revivals. Yeah. And he said, oh, those were all goody two-shoe people. I think not. I think not. Right. Later in Kentucky, I'm going to read to you about the Booths. William and Catherine Booth would see a need. They changed the culture. 
You know that Charles Dickens wrote novels exposing child labor and things like that. But after that had been exposed, then they went in and literally changed England. Yep. Hallelujah. Oops, I'm going to tell you that uh, Charles Whitney and, and the Age of Sons from Nendus Revival. Oh, well, I'll pick it later. This is what happened in, um, in the Booth's ministry. They began to see, first of all, the sex trade, and they exposed it. They got it shut down. Later on, during their research for Darkest England, I mean, they, they looked at any place where there were injustices. If there were, if there were hungry people, they fed them. If there were labor places, they, they shut them down. One place they found was that the matches, the match factory, were making people really sick. Now, here, here's the deal. As we look at a need and we think, well, we've been doing anything about that. Look at what happened here. During their research for Darkest England, one of the ills the booze had come across had to do with the manufacture of Strike Anywhere matches. The workers in the match factories were mostly women and children, some as young as eight, who worked 16-hour days with no breaks for meals. They were paid a shilling a day. Even worse, however, was that the chemicals used to make these matches were extremely toxic and with poor ventilation in the factories. The workers had no protection from the gases. After extended exposure, workers began to get toothaches and what was called flossy jaw, the rotting away of the jawbone due to exposure to the yellow phosphorus. Even though the manufacturers recognized these risks, they refused to do anything to help or protect. In response, the Salvation Army decided to go into the matchmaking business itself in order to produce matches under safer working conditions. Their factory was well lit, properly ventilated, the workers' wages were almost double, the strike any for matches factories, and also instead of using the harmful yellow phosphorus, they used red phosphorus. They produced matches with safety tips that would only strike on the box. But the quality of the working conditions enabled them to produce almost six million matches more a year. Because these matches were almost two times as expensive as the Strike Anywhere matches, the Army launched an advertising campaign to make people aware of the dangers of their competitors' products. They invited the press to tour their factory and took them to the homes of the people. These people stank of rotting flesh. They took them to the homes of the people who had worked in the competitors' factories. These people stank of rotting flesh, the effects of yellow phosphorus. And when they snuffed out their gas lights, the glow of the phosphorus was visible on their hands and teeth. The Salvationists across the nation went into local shops to tell the proprietors of the dangers of Strike Anywhere matches, urging them to carry only the Army's lights and darkest England matches. Public opinion slowly turned the Salvationists way. The government eventually enforced higher worker standards in all the factories. By the turn of the century, the, large, the largest match manufacturer in England had stopped using yellow phosphorus altogether, and then the Salvationists closed their factory down and it wasn't needed anymore. They weren't in the matchmaking business, but they were in your saving lives. Hallelujah. The northern neck needs revival. Amen. This nation needs revival. Amen. And the devil's biggest lie is when you know it can. What a lie. Yeah. If you see right away you think, uh, it's a bad culture. Yeah, it's a bad culture, but it's a big God. Oh, yeah. the, any place the gospel is preached. Amen. I feel amazing yesterday. There's a lot of evidences of the gospel of Jesus Christ, a lot of miraculous um, confirmations. But I was looking, it's weird, I was reading this article on a tribe that has never yet been reached down in um, Brazil. There was actually National Geographic reporting on it, and they're so ungodly. But it makes you think so much of the tribe where Jim Elliott and the others gave their lives. And I said, if we could get the gospel to them, they would stop looking like God, yeah, acting like God. And stuff. Oh, you said why? Because of the miraculous nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is so powerful that any limit that you think is on your life, if you will get in this word and begin to agree with it, it will take the limits off. Isn't it awesome? Yeah. There are no limits to someone who asks about gospel. And what I felt like I was supposed to ask you today is when you look ahead at 2013, do you just see another year, or are you able to say, God, this year will be a year that I'll be used to you. This year is a year that we are going to see this county change. We're going to see young people say, I mean, we've been seeing it. This isn't like we haven't been saying it. We've got people sitting right here right now that weren't saved a year ago. <laughs> Amen? And that's awesome. But God wants to just cause it to go like a snowball to where, I don't know if I've communicated 
She said, it's not too hard. Is that always too hard? No, it's not too hard for God. God's gone. Amen. I don't care. I don't care how many laws they pass. How many gay marriages they celebrate, God is still God, and He yes. is holy, and He is omnipotent. And it's time for us to take the limits off our faith and say, it. If, if, you know, just, if I gotta get these books in a bookstore, but these God's General books, where they saw Whitfield preach to crowds, if, if 80, over 80% 80 of the American populace came out to hear him. It's one of the reasons we won the revolution, because yeah. the, the colonies were so, there was so much infighting, competition, but when he came through in the 1740s and uh -huh. 50s, so many people got saved that they began to recognize each other as their brothers and sisters. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Here's my point. Any place where the kingdom of God truly comes to earth, it's going to affect society. Yeah. The, the, the booths in the Salvation Army, they, they closed down the sex trade. They, they just had a girl show yeah. up on the doorstep. They didn't believe it. They investigated the... the her story and found out there was a whole world being kept real quiet. Mm -hmm. And they went after it until they got it shut down. Hallelujah. And it's time for us to stand up and be the sons and daughters Amen. of God. Amen. 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 Am